Matthews. Oh. Can we turn? Yeah. Yeah. Turn the lights on. There we go. That's good. Yeah, we don't want them sleeping over there. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's too sleepy. Hey. Right? <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm Dan, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the project we've been working on for our Burning Man camp for the last two years. Um, we're at Sextant Camp, um, and we were uh, at uh, 630 Nestle for if anyone knows what that is. Um, I'm going to kind of just start this off by uh, passing my little props around. Hi, you made it. Oh, you yeah, that's why I can't. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Tesla coil. What is a Tesla coil? Um, I'm sort of assuming that everybody has pretty extensive radio background, but maybe, you know, I'm, I'm sure most of you know what a Tesla coil is, but I'm not assuming kind of extensive knowledge about that. Um, so a Tesla coil is uh, an air core resonant high voltage transformer. Um, uh, they were invented by Nikola Tesla in the late 1800s and uh, kind of refined in, in the early 1900s. Um, his original intention uh, with this system was to transmit power wirelessly uh, through the earth, uh, not, not via wave, radio waves, but, but actually uh, through the earth. Um, these days, uh, there are commercial applications for Tesla coils, uh, but uh, typically uh, they're more of a, a hobbyist thing. Um, and the idea is to just get these very um, visually compelling displays of, of arc discharges. Um, so here's, a, here's a picture of one. So what's the device on the bottom that looks like a parabolic dish? That's a primary coil on this, on this Tesla coil system. And this arc that's kind of up in the sky there, it's not coming out of the, no, this, why is this separated here? Oh, there's a little piece of metal that's going on right there. Oh, okay. You know, see? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a little point. Yeah, that's a little point. So, so sorry. <laughs> yeah, whatever. So, so the test of always say it's, it's, it's just kind of the neat phenomenon, okay. but it's like no, the practical um, use right now? Or? Uh, so, I guess you, so, yeah, so, so commercially, there are places where you need sort of. Uh, high voltage, high frequency um, source. Um, and it, it is used in some of those. Uh, but kind of the trend in consumer electronics is everything is small, low power, low voltage. And so the, the Tesla coil, it's not, you know, it's not, you know, something that's that's ubiquitous. There are, there are applications for commercial roasts. So. All right, so so but we're we're on the, the sort of hobby realm, right? We're trying to get these these good looking sparks. And um, so, you know, you might ask, well, okay, resonant transformer, that, that sounds cool. Why not just use, you know, a regular transformer, right? You get pretty, pretty high voltage out of those. And uh, the issue is, uh, when you start getting into the hundreds of kilovolts or, or megavolts, if you're really lucky, um, insulation becomes a real concern. So in a typical transformer, you've got, you know, say an iron core, maybe a ferrite core. Um, and uh, I mean, that's that's kind of uh, uh, you know if it's iron, it's conductive, and even if it's if it's laminated or ferrite, you know, it kind of acts as this sort of conductive surface along which stuff can travel. Um, and so, as a result, it becomes extremely hard to insulate one end of the coil from the other. You have a million volts across it. So okay, we'll say uh, you know toss out the core. We'll just go we'll just go air core, right? The issue there is that you're going to have very low coupling uh, in this transformer. Uh, again, because uh, for high coupling, you need you know, the magnetic field to be sort of right on top of each other. You need two coils to be physically close. And again, you get this problem with discharge you know, arcing between the two coils. Uh, and you can't just solve that with more insulation. You're talking, you're talking about feet thick of insulation at this point. Uh, so that's kind of out. All right, so uh, so we're gonna have to live with this this kind of low coupling coefficient. And issue there is that, that the effect of that is you get this high leakage inductance, and that severely limits uh, the voltage gain that you can get out of this transformer because uh, we've got all this we've got this big effective uh, inductive voltage divider that's kind of kind of hurting you because the magnetic fields aren't aren't really lined up well. So Tesla kind of looked at that and said, well, I've got this, this uh, 
the series parasitic inductance that I don't want. We're just going to cancel that out with a capacitor. And uh, so the Tesla coil is formed. So here's sort of the, the prototypical Tesla coil schematic. Uh, the idea here is we've got our we've got our air core transformer with really loose coupling, and then we got a capacitor here to cancel out the leakage inductance on this guy, and another capacitor there to, to cancel out that leakage inductance. Now, of course, this is only going to work at, at one frequency, uh, the resonant frequency. Uh, so the idea is you sort of uh, you know, build these coils such that this resonant circuit right here is tuned to the same frequency as this circuit. And that way, uh, when you get resonance going on here, over several cycles, um, and it's, it's uh, more cycles, the more loosely coupled it is, it takes longer for the energy to transform or to uh, transfer over, uh, you, uh, you build up sort of uh, a resonant uh, uh, signal in this, in this circuit. So what's the iron core transformer? Right. So, so this is a spark gap Tesla coil. Uh, you know, back in Tesla's day, you know, if you wanted to switch something, you, you basically used a, a spark gap, maybe a relay. Uh, they didn't have uh, nice uh, semiconductor solid state switching back then. So right here is the spark gap. Uh, the issue here, obviously, is you need to generate a high enough voltage to actually break down the air in the spark gap. So that's where this uh, transformer comes in. Uh, so in, in sort of a, a, a typical you know, small scale hobby Tesla coil you see today, this might be a neon sign transformer. Um, the bigger coil it might be like a full pig sort of a thing. And you know, you're gonna get maybe 10 to 20 kilovolts here. So enough to enough to actually spark across the across oh, the So gap. this is only for the resonance. <coughs> right. Okay. So you've got two completely different frequencies going on got in the it. circuit. So this is probably gonna be like a 60 hertz thing. And uh, over the course of a 60 hertz cycle, uh, you're gonna charge it with this capacitor to you know 10 or 20 uh, kilovolts. This gap is going to break down, shorting across this, and now you've got just a shorted capacitor inductor loop here, and that's the resonant uh, tank circuit. That's going to be for a small coil. It could it could be maybe even up to a megahertz. That's on the, the higher end, um, and uh, for a larger coil, you know, you can go down to 20, 30 kilohertz. So this is actually a very effective transmitter. <laughs> uh, I'll get to that uh, a little oh, later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was sorry if I wanted to set just up the field. Just got to tune it up, you know? <laughs> yeah. All right. So, so what does that sort of uh, uh, energy transfer look like? Uh, here's a very difficult to see space simulation. Um, so in the blue here, um, we've got that, uh, that voltage on this, on this capacitor here. And in the green, we have the, the secondary capacitor. Um, so you can see we're, we're starting out, and, and this is scaled so that you can actually see them on the same, on the same scale. Um, you know, the, the blue one would actually be much, much smaller compared to the green one if you were looking at them on the same scale. Um, but uh, basically we start out with some voltage on the, on the primary capacitor here, uh, and this is sort of the instant when the, when the spark gap closes. So we get this sort of damped sine wave at the resonant frequency of that primary circuit. And because the secondary circuit is loosely coupled, uh, but tuned to the same frequency, we get over several cycles, uh, the secondary voltage is building up here. And uh, if you uh, do everything right, uh, right about here, where you've got your know, maximum energy transfer, there's very little voltage left on, on that circuit. Right about here uh, is where you want to spark out and make a, make a big... Uh, so that's like uh, 7 million volts there, peak to peak. Yeah, yeah. And that spark is continuous or a not, Well, it's not so, it looks continuous to the eye because you know, anything over about 25 bangs per second is sort of perceived as being continuous. Um, if you're just running this off of sort of, uh, you know, uh, voltage, you know, like a, like a 60 hertz source, you're going to typically get 120 sparks per second, and one oh, on the okay. positive, one on the negative end, uh, depending on, you know, and that's if you sort of have your have your primary capacitor uh, sized correctly to, to charge up in that time. Um, and then the actual resonance, you can see, you know, it, we're, in, we're in tens of microseconds here. And obviously, it, you know, depending on your resonance frequency, that's going to change. But it's a much faster phenomenon than the, than the, than the recitation rate. Yeah. So what's it kind of look like? 
this is uh, sort of a, a figure adapted from one of Tesla's uh, original patents on the magnifying transmitter. Um, so here we have uh, the, uh, the primary coil. You can see the sort of coppery orangish thing. We have the primary capacitor in the diagram. Uh, difficult to see is the secondary, which kind of runs along here. Um, and then we have a, an additional uh, resonant coil going up here. Uh, this is a conductive rod that takes the voltage up to the, the toroid on the top. And the discharge path is from the toroid on the top to? The air, to everything. Um, to the air. Know, so then how does it transmit the voltage through the ground? So so Tesla, so um, here you can see this thing is going to a, a ground plate here. It's a little, a little difficult to see in this diagram. Um, so Tesla's idea was actually uh, to uh, size the toroid on the top to be large enough and have a, a sort of a large radius of curvature so that there was no, no spark breakout. Because uh, to him, any, any spark breakout represented loss in the system. Right? He's trying to efficiently transmit power uh, through the earth from one place to another. Uh, so the idea here is that we're actually, we're running this big kind of current uh, between uh, you know, this, this toroid up here and the, and the ground, you know, this is supposed to be a really good ground connection. And uh, the earth, uh, if you think of it, so you know, everybody knows the resistance is you know, rho L over A. And uh, dirt is kind of a, a crappy rho, but it's got a really great A, right? The, the cross-sectional area of the earth is very large. Um, and so as a result, um, you know, as you guys so from radio, it, if you kind of set up your driving system right, it can be a fairly good conductor from one place to another, um, even over large distances. Um, and so the idea is you get this sort of high frequency, high voltage thing going on um, you know, between sort of the, the ionosphere and the ground, and you just uh, and you set up one system to, to pump energy in, and you can set up another system tuned to the same frequency somewhere else uh, set up to, to extract energy from. And then the idea then was to transmission stations. You'd have your substation, and then you would distribute power to. Yeah, you could. Or you could just each home could have their own little resonant coil on the ground, or you know, there's a lot of ways you can set it up. Problem is, it's very difficult to charge people for that. <laughs> you make your own little coil stick in the ground. And you is that why it failed? I I suspect that's the reason it failed. It's very difficult to commercialize. And so Edison wanted to do a DC power. Yeah, so, so uh, Edison's kind of deal was, you know, he started out with, with DC current. Uh, he didn't like, didn't like AC current because it uh, instantaneously didn't, didn't seem to uh, obey Ohm's law because of inductance and capacity. Um, the issue back then was, again, they didn't have solid state switching. Um, and so uh, it was very difficult to uh, change one DC voltage to another. Now we have switching power supplies that do that very well. Uh, back then, you had to do something you know, where you maybe, maybe uh, use a, a, a motor coupled to a generator and, and sort of do it that way. But uh, it, was, it was difficult. Uh, so Tesla's AC system allowed the use of you know, much cheaper transformers, which could do this, this voltage uh, changing very efficiently. Um, and that way, you could transmit high voltage, low current. This is James, everybody. Uh, yeah, James. Uh, you could transmit the power as a high voltage, low current um, through, through, the, through the wires, and that would have much lower ohm's law. Right. So that kind of brings us wow. to uh, that was that was Tesla's sort of original system. Uh, you know, these days, especially in the last decade or so, um, IGBTs, isolated peak by four transistors have started getting, getting really good, and they're sort of available and, and much more uh, reliable than they have been in the past. Hold on, guys. Can we maybe eat after Dan gives his talk? <laughs> okay. Yeah, because yeah, people are going to be concentrating on the pizza rather than for what Dan's saying. I mean, Sorry. Pizza may be more interesting anyway. Oh. <laughs> Anyway, so, so moving along to present day, so we've got these, these nifty silicon switches, um, and that's actually what, um, what these guys are that I passed around. Each of these uh, bricks is, uh, is an IGBT. And uh, 
so they uh, these these IGBTs are an H for H configuration, and the system is rated for uh, 1,200 volts at 1,800 amps, um, switching at 50 kilohertz. What's the uh, RDS on? Uh, IGBTs don't really have an on resistance. They function more similar to a BGT. It's more like an on voltage. Um, and I think in the in the sort of you know kiloamp range, it's it's something on the order of, uh, of you know 200 millivolts. So Drop. there's still a whole lot of power to dissipate because those are the heat sinks, right? Yeah, and uh, these heat sinks. Um, so we uh, yeah, I think I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll, I'll come back. Uh, anyway, so is this, is this your street or where? This is not our coil system. Okay. This is uh, another coil system that was just uh, posted on the internet. So okay. I, uh, I stole their, stole their little thing. Uh, so uh, why would you want to do do a solid state coil when you've got this this cool spark gap system that already exists? And uh, the answer to that is it gives you a lot more control over um, sort of the, the input voltage for a spark gap. Uh, you basically, you have to put all of the energy that you're going to have go into a spark. All of that has to you know, initially go onto this high voltage tank capacitor, and then it just goes out through the spark gap. That, um, you know, and, and sort of the rate that it does that is, uh, you can't really you know, control that, that very well. I mean, you can sort of set it up to be something, but you can't then vary it. And, and uh, additionally, you're sort of the, the coupling between the primary and secondary um, controls the, uh, the sort of number of cycles that it takes for the energy to go from the primary circuit to the secondary. Um, so you don't have very direct control over that either. With a solid state uh, system, you can do something uh, more like, like uh, CW, uh, where you can use many cycles to, to sort of more slowly build up a much higher voltage on the secondary, so you can continuously pump energy into the system instead of just doing it in, in one shot. Um, additionally, um, so uh, the spark discharge uh, heats the air you know, locally on the spark. Um, I'm sure you guys all sort of heard lightning that's sort of going on there. Um, uh, but with a crystal coil, you're doing uh, sparks Know, in very rapid succession. And uh, additionally, you can sort of modulate the, the power or the pulse repetition uh, frequency that the, the sparks are coming out, uh, especially with a, with a solid state coil. And uh, by modulating the power, you're modulating the heat and you're modulating how much the air is expanding and contracting every cycle. And that lets you play some music. Mm. So here's a, again, this is not our coil, but it's pretty cool. Um, Oh no, there's no sound. Um, uh, we have sound, don't we? Do we have there sound? should be some speakers in the bag. There are. Yeah. You have sound on your computer. So I think I, have, I think it's trying to put sound through the HDMI. I can uh, oh. I can disconnect that and probably get sound out of my computer. If that's uh, of interest. Yeah. Once so this that. would need to go. Oh, good. Okay. So here, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go ahead and uh, go back. The sound that you're hearing is coming directly from the sparks. It's, yeah. it's, uh, no, there's no like extra speakers. Um, I mean, obviously, this is a good one. You were there in person. Oh, yeah. That's right. So it's like a full orchestra. Yeah. It's yeah. like harmony and. Yep. Wow. wow. So there's a nice commercial use of the dancing. Absolutely. Well, do you know how it makes so, yeah, so it's basically, you know, you're, you're turning these sparks on and off, you know, hundreds of times per second, you know, at, at audio frequencies. Mm -hmm. And every time the spark gets turned on, it heats up the air, you know, the air expands, and then uh, you turn the spark off, and the air cools. It's like and a speaker, tracks, right? Speakers and and that the tone is being put in by you, <coughs> or is that being generated by the artifact? The, the function of the frequency that you 
that you that you repeat the sparks, yeah. So you're just modulating the you're just modulating the transformers through the solid state so H bridges, and right. when the air heats and cools, it. Yeah, I'm, I don't know what what's the source of the frequent of the audio frequency where you set the right. So 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 uh, you know if you wanted to do say like an A tone 440 hertz, you would just set your spark repetition rate. So you second. must have some. You must have a program then. So you control. If you're controlling the frequency, the audio frequency is going in. Right. Exactly. That and that's that's not of the. Uh, so you could, you could actually put the output from a, a rock rock and roll band into that. And you'd get yeah. the same thing. But how do you get all the various? You know the harmony. Oh, it sounds like multiple instruments, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Superposition. Yeah. Okay, so so different sparks are doing different tones, right? You have all these arms coming off the sparks, so this, no. might, this well, might be no. the trombone here, this is the trumpet no. there, no? No, <laughs> no. Uh, the, the sort no, of, no trombone. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, the, the spark is sort of turning on and off so fast that there's still this sort of localized uh, hot air, and so um, the spark sort of wants to go close to the same place as it has previously. Ah. Um, so it kind of the, the shape of the spark is not uh, not determined so, so much. It's serial then, right? The, the spark is being modulated it, from here to here. The, it could be a whole it's a whole string of notes as a spark. So it's also well, no, not no, always no, no, no. it's, it's just a superposition waveform of audio of different yeah. audio waveforms. Oh, superposition. Okay, 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 okay. Can you do that again? I want to hear that. That would be really cool. I want one in my bedroom. <laughs> yeah. Oh, your wife's gonna love that. Yeah. Well, look at that. Are you doing that? She just says, "Sure, sit up." <laughs> so, uh, uh, this system is is set up as sort of a, a pulse repetition system, where if you want, you know, a 400 hertz tone, you give it 400 sparks per second. Uh, there are also systems, uh, typically known as, as plasma speakers where you're, you're just uh, running at CW the whole time and you just modulate the power and that gives you a much a much smoother envelope. So you can see this, this it sounds kind of kind of harsh, a little tinny, it's not like a, a smooth note. Yeah. Uh, we can do smooth notes with the same sort of idea. Uh, the issue is uh, it's uh, a lot more power intensive, especially if you're trying to get the same size spark so for long sparks, you want sort of a, a low G cycle. For smooth sound, you want a continuous G cycle. So there's so many odds there. Uh, are those two, two coils operating independently, or are they in phase? Um, they are so operating independently. It's, it's not jumping across from one of the right, other. So one of them could they're, they're operate like, yeah. by itself, or did you need to? Yeah, no. You, uh, this this system, they've got them totally independent. Um, and that's so they can do you know cool music things where you know music's coming out of just this one or just this one. Yeah. How big are they? Stereo. The, I mean these guys. Huh? Yeah. Well, there's no there's no scale. Like six feet. Mm -hmm. Okay. You don't have tape. Okay. No, no. It's on a street. Yeah, it's on some guy's driveway. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> yeah, at least the one that's at Maker Fair, they usually all, they often put a cage in between that you can stand uh, that right, volunteers right. can stand in. So <laughs> the, the, the the towers are a little bit taller than the cage, and the cage is maybe about eight foot. Uh, and you're actually. standing in the cage while it's sparking. Yeah. Are these like sand Because it's a, it's a Faraday cage. <laughs> no, it's usually some crazy kid that does it. Me, me, me. Were you one at one time? <laughs> no, I wasn't young enough to last. You are a crazy kid. So that was, that was somebody else's coil. These are our coils. Um, and this is our Burning Man camp, Texan camp. Um, How many of you were there? Uh, we were about, about 30 people in the camp. Oh, okay. And where did the name come from? I'll let Tori uh, take that one. A navigational instrument. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, man. So Tori is the, the illustrious leader of our environmental uh, tribe. Fearless leader. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, you know, we've got our, our coils here, so they're, uh, they're 32 feet tall uh, at the top. Um, this is our, uh, our dome and our uh, tower. We've got a zip line going from the top of the tower. It goes uh, 350 feet down to the next block over. Um, the top of the tower is uh, 52 feet. And uh, we've got a little, uh, a little platform in here and a, and a functioning bar uh, on top of our dome. So 
Okay, I'll give you Jake more respect for you. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't this event like a one-week or is it two-week thing? It's a one-week thing. Um, we kind of turned it into a three-week thing. It oh, okay. takes a week to put I it up. And yeah. We can take it down, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, I recognize why it's on the van now. Right. Uh, these, these are the, the triple one ones, right? Yeah, every, yeah. Every yeah, thing. this is the, they're, they're the primary thing. type. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so the, I guess I'll go over so, so these are our, our toroids up here. They're eight feet in diameter. The minor diameter is uh, two feet. Uh, these are our resonator coils. Uh, these are eight feet tall by uh, just under four feet in diameter. Um, and this here is our, our transformer. You can see the primary going on right here, the big copper tube. And then uh, we've got the secondary going on right here. Uh, and it's uh, about five feet by five feet. Uh, and then Who designed the transformer? Was that you, Dan? Uh, the mechanical part of it? Yeah. Well, I mean, the... Tor Tori did all of the mechanical design. <coughs> He's, uh, so the spacing and the air insulation between, I mean, there must have been... Uh, we collaborated, yeah, yeah. On, on stuff like that. Yeah, that's all collaborative. You have a certain space and, and exactly. the dielectric's going to break down. Mm -hmm. What do you use for insulation? Air. Uh, basically air everywhere, yeah. Um, so... Um, the uh, the wire the, the the fine wire which is each eight gauge uh, around this and it is insulated with uh, polyimide polyethylene um, but uh, you know, most of the most of the actual insulation is here just that actual insulation is sufficient enough to to really handle the Dan's been talking about this for a couple of years at work while he's taking vacation. I had no <laughs> idea the scope of what you guys put together, seriously. So do you do little different things each year? Or? Generally make it bigger. <laughs> <laughs> Get more ambitious. That's the trend and the goal. Okay. All right, so kind of going into this thing, you know, what are our goals for this? Um, you know, we wanted big sparks. We were, we were hoping for about 20 foot sparks. Um, it needs to be, you know, we need to be able to transport it. And so that, that ties into weight, because we needed to be able to carry it around with, you know, four guys maybe. Um, and uh, the physical size of it, right, we need to be able to fit it in this trailer that we have for it. Um, and also it needs to be sort of easy to assemble and disassemble, because we're going to be lugging it around, you know, like we've got Burning Man every year and these other things. Uh, the other thing we wanted was for it to be sort of a, a high efficiency, uh, sort of novel design. We wanted to really take advantage of these new solid state technology uh, for the switching and have a really sort of high Q system. We wanted to uh, try to extract as much of the power from our generator um, and actually put it into the spark instead of uh, losing it elsewhere. Okay, so so what are the sort of the, some of the design considerations? Um, well, it's uh, you know, at its at its heart, this the whole secondary system is really just an RLC system. Um, so we've got the, the inductance, we've got the L. Um, uh, for the uh, to sort of design the inductor, uh, we used this uh, Wheeler formula uh, right here, um, which turns out to be remarkably accurate as long as the uh, radius of your coil um, is, uh, is less than the length of the coil. So if you have a really short, fat coil, you know, this, this uh, equation here starts to, starts to break down. But uh, you know, once you get where the where the length is at least a diameter, which is you know, any sort of reasonable solenoid is going to be at least that, um, you know, you can get it to within a couple percent accuracy. Um, we had um, great success with that. Uh, then we've got the the C part, of it, right? So the, the capacitance sort of takes uh, takes two parts. Uh, the first is the isotropic or self capacitance of the toroid itself, the donut on top. Um, and uh, this is basically, you can think of it as, as the capacitance between, say, the toroid and the earth. Uh, but it's more properly thought of as uh, the capacitance between the toroid and uh, an infinite sphere of conductive material placed infinitely far away. So in your schematic at the very, very beginning, you had the, there were two capacitors. There was one on the resonant side, right? So everything that I'm going to talk about uh, from here on out is just the secondary side. Do you have a schematic that shows all the sort of ancillary incidental capacitance and inductance resistance and stuff? Um, 
Not really, okay. no. And then the other question is, have you measured any of this? How close is reality to what formulas say? And how do you measure yeah. it? Yeah, so, so, uh, um, so measuring stuff, uh, you know, the inductance was fairly straightforward. We just got an inductance meter. Um, it turned out to be uh, quite accurate. That, you know, that was accurate within, I think, uh, 2%. Uh, so I was very pleased about that. Um, the um, uh, DC resistance was was like spot on to within you know uh, multimeter uh, <laughs> resolution, um, and that's you know to be expected. A little array is pretty pretty easy to easy to come up with. Um, the capacitance we didn't measure directly, but we got that by measuring the resonant frequency of the system. Uh, our resonant frequency was uh, measured uh, about uh, 56 kilohertz. And uh, we kind of went into it expecting uh, 50 kilohertz, so we were, you know, five percent off. So there's no actual physical capacitor just formed right. by the toroids of the Earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and even if there weren't any Earth, that wouldn't really change the space. Yeah, it's just space. Space capacitor. Yeah. Okay. So it's self capacitor. Right. Um, the other sort of uh, part of the capacitance here is the the straight capacitance of the, of the inductor itself. So sort of uh, popular belief I've found is that uh, straight capacitance in an inductor is primarily uh, between two adjacent windings, two windings connect each other, not sure of any capacitance. Mm -hmm. However, uh, that doesn't turn out to, uh, to pan out very well. Um, if that were the case, you'd expect a uh, large change in capacitance as you change wire spacing in an inductor. And you typically, at least in the form factors we're talking about here with these, with these solenoids, um, you don't see much change in that uh, with you know, different uh, wire diameter or spacing or number of turns or anything like that. What turns out to be uh, by far the dominant uh, sort of source of, of capacitance here is actually a very similar uh, isotropic or self-capacitance phenomenon. Um, so it's uh, you can see in this in this equation, which Medhurst figured out I think in the 1930s, um, everything is based off the overall dimensions of the coil, the length of the coil, the diameter of the coil, and you don't see anything like turn to turn spacing in there. Um, and this was also you know again we using this formula we were able to get within five percent uh, error on our frequency. So this uh, this formula worked out pretty well. Um, the 5% error, I would actually uh, attribute not to problems with this formula, but to the fact that when you sort of um, add the toroid and the coil, you, the capacitance you end up with should be a little bit less than the sum of the parts. Um, and the reason for that is you get some electrostatic shielding. Um, so you should you should up end up with a slightly higher frequency than you get from just adding these together. And we did. Um, so I, I'm, uh, as far as I can tell, this, this formula does, a, does quite a good job. All right, finally, we got the resistance. <coughs> and, uh, it seems like resistance should be the easy one, but it's actually the one that, that was the most complicated to figure out. So you start out, you got the, uh, the DC resistance. That one's easy, and again, we measured it, and it was, it was quite accurate. But then you have to add in all of the sort of uh, AC effects. And that's things like skin effect, which you know, if you guys are hands, I'm sure you, you understand that. Uh, what high, frequency is this then? 56 kilohertz, okay. right, which is much lower than it is. you guys are. So there is skin effect at 56 kilohertz? Well, there's skin effect at yeah, every yeah. High voltage affects the skin effect yeah. at that too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the sort of uh, issue of skin effect, the skin depth uh, changes with the square root of frequency. Um, so, you know, if you're, so we're at 50 kilohertz. You know, if you're at uh, say uh, 500 megahertz or whatever, um, you know we're only we're only different by a factor of 100 in the skin depth, even though it's a factor of 10,000 in frequency square regulation. Um, so yeah, so the skin depth doesn't go down very quickly. And here's the here's the formula for the skin depth. Basically, what that means is um, you know you're only going to get kind of current flowing through through maybe two or, or three skin depths kind of decays exponentially uh, as you get into the lab. So you kind of end up with this sort of 
conducting band around the edge of the wire and the interior of the wire is, uh, is not conducting that. Then you got proximity effect. So skin effect is, is uh, caused by, yeah, I guess, sorry, let me jump back. So skin effect is caused by the parasitic inductance in this conductor. So you got current flowing that induces magnetic field. That magnetic field induces an opposite current, and that's, that's what cancels out the current that would be going through the middle of the conductor. Proximity effect is the same thing, except we're talking about two wires now. So we've got this coil, we've got a whole bunch of parallel wires, going go in the same direction in all of them. You get a magnetic field from one wire uh, that creates this, uh, yeah, the magnetic field, and then it induces an opposite current in the other wire, so it's kind of pushing current backwards, and that current cancels out some of the forward current that you otherwise get. And the effect of that is uh, sort of the areas kind of uh, uh, between the wires, or the, the sort of side of the wire next to other wires doesn't get utilized fully. Um, there are formulas for proximity effect, but I found this table to be a lot more uh, illustrative. So if you have a really tightly wound coil, this is the spacing over here. Um, and this is the, the length to diameter ratio here. Um, our coil is about, about two for length to diameter. So if we had a really tightly wound coil, that is the turns were separated only by a very thin dielectric insulator, we expect four times the resistance that you'd otherwise uh, get from just taking into account the, the DC resistance and the skin effect alone. Right? And that's, that's really gonna hurt our cube. We don't want that, right? And then as you sort of uh, you know, go down, you, you space the wire further and further apart. So like 0.5 is you have a full wire diameter between each of your wires. And now we're, you know, it's a little more reasonable. It's a little under two. So, and then uh, as you go down, it sort of asymptotically approaches one, right? Um, so uh, what we ended up doing is uh, we used this, uh, this three helix design. Um, and the idea was, um, we sort of alternate the radius uh, for each turn, and that lets us, um, on the local scale, space out wires uh, from each other. Um, but at the global scale, uh, it's not a big effect. The, the overall radius of the coil is, is similar. I'll show you a picture of that later on so you can sort of see what I'm talking about. Um, other effects that we have, uh, radiation loss. I mean, this is, after all, you know, a big AC voltage. You know, it's basically a dipole, right? We've got this, you know, some separation, big, big voltage going on. Uh, however, uh, we don't really want, certain, you know, this is not a radio, we don't want to, to radiate energy away. We want to keep it all and drive it all into the spark. Fortunately, uh, Tesla coil is not a very good radiator, at least at, at the resonant frequency. Um, so, you know, 50 kilohertz, your wavelength is like six kilometers or something, right? And we're packing this into 20 feet. Um, so I'm sure you guys know a really short dipole has a really small radiation resistance, right? It's not a good radiator. So that, that helps us out. Um, we expect to see very, very low loss from radiation. There's also eddy currents. So the, the uh, sort of magnetic field of the coil can induce current in the toroid um, or in any other sort of metal conductors nearby, and that's no good. Um, one thing we did with the toroid to reduce that was to split it into multiple sections that were only joined at the center. So that way, instead of having a big conducting ring, um, you know, we had sort of smaller sections. There wasn't a big loop for the current to go around. Um, and that splitting it up also let it uh, be, be uh, sort of assembled and, and transported more effectively as well. Uh, other forms of loss, so we also have corona loss, right? This is a high voltage thing. We're potentially trying to build this up over many cycles. Um, so there is going to be high voltage hanging around for, for a longer time than there would be on a traditional coil. And uh, any, any sort of form of loss, like corona loss, just electrons jumping in space uh, to get away from other electrons, uh, shows up as a similar effect to resistance and, uh, and lowers the Q of the system. Uh, finally, there's the spark. And the spark is, is, you know, we want that, uh, but it does sort of show up in the circuit uh, as, a, as a resistance. That's, that's sort of a, a good way of modeling it, because uh, it, it is a way that you're dissipating energy. So, uh, you know, a high efficiency uh, resonance system is one with a high Q factor. 
Uh, Q is uh, 1 over R root L over C. So to get a high Q, you want uh, a small R, a small C, and a big L. Problem, obviously, is that uh, for the, the physical structures that, that fight, right, to have, a, to have a big L, you want you know, a really uh, you know, large coil with a lot of turns, maybe fine wires spaced close together. But uh, if you use fine wires spaced close together, you get a high resistance. That's not good. Um, for a small capacitance, you want a physically small thing, right? Because it's mostly isotropic capacitance. The problem with the small thing is that uh, you can't, again, you've got to put your wires close together or have fewer turns, and that hurts both your R and your L. And uh, if you make the toroid uh, uh, smaller, uh, you reduce the radius of curvature, and you uh, potentially uh, get spark breakout uh, before you want it, before you fully transferred enough energy into the system. Uh, so, uh, is this frequency here on the right, this, so the Q is also equal to frequency times the Yeah, these, these expressions are equivalent. Right, right? so the higher the frequency, then the higher the Q is going to be. Right, but the frequency is controlled by the resistance and the capacitance, right, because we're uh -huh. operating at the resonance. So we can't just we can't, we can't just tweak, right? That's what we were saying. Yeah. When, you, when you called and asked, you know, I mean, Q is not high enough. Yeah. Okay. So everything ties into the physical sort yeah. of design of these components. So you know, not a big spreadsheet. This is just a very small uh, piece of that spreadsheet, but uh, this is sort of the design we ended up settling on. Uh, so you can see here we're using eight gauge wire. Um, we have a uh, we ended up using aluminum wire. Um, so aluminum by volume is not as good a conductor as copper, but by weight, it's a much better conductor than copper. And we were actually sort of weight limited here because we needed to be able to haul this thing around. So it turned out that by going to a thicker gauge aluminum wire, uh, we were able to get uh, predicted higher Q than we would for the same weight of, of copper wire. Um, we ended up uh, choosing sort of a maximum dimension of, of eight feet in length by four feet in radius for the coil, and uh, eight feet in diameter for the uh, for the toroid, um, and that was that was purely for the, for the trans. You know, anything larger than that was going to be really difficult to transport um, in the trailer that we were able to obtain. Um, so with sort of those those general constraints in mind. Uh, everything else kind of just falls out of that. You can see we're, we're uh, expecting a frequency of about 50 kilohertz here, um, and we're expecting a Q factor of just under 1400. Uh, now this Q factor is very optimistic. Um, it doesn't, so this, this model is not taking uh, things into account like dielectric losses or you know, just, just moisture in the air uh, causing loss. Um, so as a result, I wouldn't actually expect to get anything like that. However, uh, we were able to, at times, uh, measure Q factors that were about half of that, which um, I'm quite happy about. Was that high enough to generate the spark that you wanted? Uh, Q of 600. So, uh, one, one big piece of learning that we did uh, this year with this coil is that there's a big difference, it turns out, between measuring Q at low voltage and high voltage. Uh, we believe that's because of uh, sort of corona loss in the system. So uh, we did some very low voltage measurements that sort of showed this high Q of you know, 3700. Um, uh, but when we went to actually pour high voltage power into it, uh, we actually saw a much lower Q of around 50. Um, so that's uh, that's uh, you know some future work that we're gonna that's always nice to hear. <laughs> All right, so on to the, the actual construction. So uh, Tori is the, the uh, genius mechanical engineer here. Um, he, uh, he kind of added this whole uh, physical design up. So this is the, uh, the coil form, uh, the CAD model of the coil form that we, uh, we made. Uh, and here is the actual fully constructed coil form. Uh, Are so you building this in a shop or a house? It looks like a house. This is at Tech Shop. Actually, in uh, in Redwood City, uh, we do a lot of stuff at tech shop. Um, so you can see here, um, we've got the the sort of uh, structural part of it is uh, plywood, 
um, coded in epoxy. Um, and we've got these polycarbonate uh, cones kind of sticking out. The idea there to be uh, uh, being that we want to keep as much material away from the wire as we can. We want very little other than air near the wire for, to keep dielectric losses down. Um, additionally, uh, it's, it's somewhat difficult to see in this picture, but we actually have three different winding diameters, like I was talking about earlier, and that's to reduce the proximity effect uh, so that we can fit the same number of lines into the same physical space, but still have them spread far apart uh, without significantly affecting our impression. And you said the wires are actually polyamide coated? Uh, po yeah, it's got polyamide <coughs> and polyester. Is it necessary? Um, Does that actually add dielectric? So, you know, polyamides are it's, it's, they're, they're pretty low dielectric loss things, it's very thin coating. Uh, the reason it's nice to have those is to just uh, reduce the effect of, uh, of sparks traveling along the surface of these cones. Um, huh? You guys are, uh, I assume, kind of aware of that phenomenon. So basically, it's um, uh, a spark traveling just through air. Uh, is a lot harder to get started than when traveling on, along a surface. And so kind of a typical rule of thumb is, um, you know, a spark will go three times the distance if it has sort of a, even a, a non-conducting surface to travel along. Uh, this that is why it's the way the high voltage towers are. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so anyway, yeah, this is our, this is our transformer. Um, we've just got it uh, rigged up on a pole and we just spin it and uh, stick the wire on as we Here's the, the completed transformer. So we've got a, a thick primary uh, copper tubing here, a uh, thin eight gauge aluminum wire out here. Um, you notice we can we um, we sort of shape this uh, almost not quite parabolically, but it's got some curve to it. Uh, the reason for that is uh, we're trying to simultaneously get higher coupling, but but keep things far apart so that they don't arc to each other. So uh, you know, we're talking talking you know 100 kilovolts from end to end here, um, so that the ends can't be near near the primary coil and keep those far apart. Uh, but at the same time, um, we want to take advantage of you know have as much mutual inductance as we can get, right? Really, really try to follow a field line. Um, so if you've seen you know, pictures of field lines of a, of a solenoid, especially a, sh a short one like this, you know, they kind of they kind of they curve out. All right, so we're trying to kind of follow that and just pick up a little bit extra uh, mutual inductance there. That's beautiful. Look at that. And it looks cool. <laughs> so uh, here's the, the system as we're setting it up at Marine Man. Uh, you can see we've got these uh, these big steel bases. Um, the coils are uh, loaded onto these plywood masts, um, and then we. Uh, Using a winch system, we uh, rotate the mast vertical and then hoist the coils up the mast. And this lets us set up this 32 foot tall system without needing heavy equipment. And Dan, can I jump in and say that uh, James here designed all of the steel bases. So each one of those bases weighs 980 pounds. Cool. <laughs> and, uh, What's your wind load factor? Like, how high a wind can you get before you have to take them down? Uh, so. My aerospace engineer, Francesco Giannini from Aurora Flight Sciences, did a perforated cylinder model for us. And at uh, 97 miles an hour, he predicts 500 pounds on center line for, for one of the resonators. And we, we took that for one of the toroids as a rough order of magnitude. And that sort of uh, goes down the guy lines into your ground anchors and helps you select your ground anchor. Set up time for one tower. Everything you got in a day. Heart, soul, blood, sweat, tears. <laughs> 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 yeah. All right, and here's you talk to the submarine because that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you'll notice a, a conspicuous lack of pictures of these coils actually sparking. Um, I don't know if you'll believe me, but I, I will claim that we did get them sparking briefly. Uh, the issue that we, we sort of had is, you know, as all, as all good projects do, we ran into a time crunch. We were still uh, kind of constructing them uh, you know, the day before that we, we had to head up to Burning Man. 
So as a result, we had very little time for, for testing. So this is the second year, right, of having these? Is it the same design that you guys had year one? No. So these are completely different? Some, um, the, some parts were. The bases are the same. But the coils, different coils, different transformers, the toroids, the toroids. Okay. everything else is different. All yeah, the so coils are different. So new masts, new coils, this is new. New transformers. Um, and, the, yeah. and what was the power source again? Uh, we had a 17 kilowatt gas generator. So what, that, and that's plugged directly into the primary? Uh, no, that goes into the, uh, into the, uh, uh, so we've got some, some decoupling capacitors for that, so we, uh, we rectify it. Uh, get so the 17 a, kilowatts is just 60 hertz? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so 120 we, volt. We send that through a, a full wave rectifier, and that gives us um, about... Uh, oh, you're making it a switching supply, is that right? Right, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so we end up with this sort of uh, this DC power supply on these large capacitors. Um, and then we take that supply and run it through our, our IGBTs um, to, to do the 50 kilohertz. So the IC with a hole popped at the top of it is that why it stopped sparking? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, so we got you know we got a couple we got sparks right before we left uh, down here, um, and then we were great pack it up and ship it up. And, uh, six we foot sparks. We set it up. Yeah, I would I would. Uh, estimate we got about six foot sparks, which is you know a far cry from the from the twenty that was the design goal, but uh, you know, it's better than nothing, better than last year certainly. Um, uh, so we uh, we set it up at Burning Man, and on the first night we uh, uh, we set it off, and you know we got our, our nice six foot sparks again, and uh, you know ran it briefly, and, and then shut everything down and, and uh, discharged the capacitors, and I went over and. and uh, touched it to feel how hot it was, and it was you know it was quite warm, but I you know I thought to myself you know well I think we could run this for about five minutes before we uh, we run into trouble, uh, so you know I turned everything back up and turned it back on. Four minutes and thirty seconds later, uh, there was a loud pop, and uh, this board uh, got ejected from the from the system, it flew about fifteen feet across the playa. And uh, it turned out we had, we had overheated this uh, IGBT. Is it soldered on the back? Uh, that's right, yeah. So it, it, uh, it blew off the solder joints. So, so this board was soldered to little pins on these IGBTs. Uh, so it blew those. You can see it totally, totally bent those pins. Uh, obviously, this thing is, is not in good shape anymore. Um, and uh, it, it, it blew uh, during, the, during the explosion. Um, I suspect uh, some of the high voltage got into my sort of sensitive control circuitry, because it actually blew up a couple of ceramic capacitors, um, as well as the isolator chip that I was using. I noticed it picked you out in one chip. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he, he let the smoke out. So, yeah, yeah big, big time. Mm -hmm. uh, let the smoke out and the, and the noise and the lightning out. So, um, uh, I, did, I did make an attempt to fix it, but was un, unable to you know, up and burning man. Have. What was the issue that caused it to spark? Too much heat generated? Yeah, this, I mean, yeah, it's just overheat. So you, you, you have liquid cool? That is, that is a, a thought for the future, yeah. Bringing spares? Bringing <laughs> spares is also, yeah. But I mean, if, so, so you've got two things you need to improve for next year, right? You need to increase your Q so that your sparks are longer. Right. And and then cool the control. The control. No, no change in the electronic design of the board. Um. Uh, I, I don't think that's you know I think there are some things that we could do to make it better. But so there were no uh, design limits that were exceeded. It's just overused. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this board was fine. It was. Yeah. 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 I mean. So so beefier cooling system is going to help a lot. And uh, yeah, yeah, we're going to try to control the what we think is the corona loss. Whatever the effect is that's causing us to have a much lower Q at, uh, at high voltage than we do at, at the low voltage measure. Are you going to look something like Freon or oil? Or? Um, not sure yet. <laughs> kind of. So, so Burning Man was uh, just the end of August, and uh, yes, it's a month later, a little more than a month, but uh, we're still uh, we're still recovering somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think in the, in the next few months we're gonna, we're gonna get back on this and figure out what this is. Well, I thought it was a lot of wind this year. Is that typical? Or? Yeah. Uh, so so Burning Man is uh, it's a place of wind and dust. Um, 
Do you know how much how much was the wind that when we were up at uh, Jupiah for the ground anchors? That that had to be on the order of sixty miles an hour. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty impressive. So, uh, yeah, so there there is you know intense wind and, and dust storms uh, there, but uh, again the system can actually handle that without anything to even come down. Very impressive. Any other questions? <laughs> well, we do what we can. So, um, um, I realize you guys are all comfortable in your seats. Uh, we did actually bring out the trailer um, with this thing in it, if you guys are interested in seeing it. It's in a, a state of disarray, because again, <laughs> we're still, we haven't quite, quite gotten organized since the burn yet, but um, uh, it's very much the case that you can, you know, look in the door and, and sort of physically see these coils. See the Torah. Right. 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 See the Torah right. sitting on top of a 